types of intermolecular forces. <coughs> um, intermolecular prefixes. Prefixes are important. What does inter mean? Between. Intermolecular forces are between molecules. Okay, we're not talking about bonds here within a molecule. Those are intramolecular. So these are between molecules. Forces of attraction between molecules. And we kind of uh, talked around these because we were talking about melting points and boiling points and about things sticking together. These are the actual forces that cause things to stick together. So the strength of the intermolecular forces determines the state of the substance at room temperature. Is it going to be a solid, a liquid, or a gas? If we have strong intermolecular forces, then the substance will likely be a liquid or a solid. It'll have a relatively high melting point because the forces of attraction are enough to keep the molecules together. If the forces of attraction are weak, then it will be a gas at room temperature because we learned about gases, and gas particles don't interact with each other. They just fly off on their own, and they, they collide and bounce off, and they don't actually stick together. But in liquids and solids, the particles do stick together. So there are three forces that we're going to talk about. Um, the first one is the dispersion force. This one has a lot of, of other names. So you may have heard these um, if you've had chemistry before using a different book. They're sometimes called van der Waals forces. That's the one I learned. Um, induced dipole forces. That's my favorite because it's more descriptive. Uh, dispersion forces, London forces, and one book even calls them London dispersion forces. So all of those names are talking about the same thing. So I'm going to try to call them dispersion forces, but if I slip, please forgive me. So this is the default intermolecular force. All molecules, all atoms have this force of attraction. And dispersion forces are caused by fluctuations in the electron distribution within the molecule or the atom. All atoms have electrons, all molecules have electrons, all substances have dispersion forces. So what, what this arises from is that at any given instant, the electrons in an atom or a molecule can be unevenly distributed. Hopefully we've got a picture coming up here. There we go. So let's look at this little tiny atom, helium. So here's helium, there's its nucleus. Helium has two electrons. And these electrons are doing their crazy electron thing, and they're in this, in this cloud 90% of the time. And so most of the time, they're kind of spread out, but occasionally they could both end up on the same side of the atom, just spontaneously. It's a little bit like, you know, my kids. I have, I have one picture of them, all six of them sitting on half the couch. Nobody told them to go there. Right now I can't quite remember why they were all there. But that's not normal, is it? Usually they're spread around the house. But occasionally they all clump up in one place. And that can happen with electrons too. So when these electrons are both on one side of the atom, that causes an imbalance in the charges. Because here we've got the nucleus with its positive 2 charge. And now we have the electrons with their negative charges on the same side. It's a little bit like a boat. Maybe you're on one of the bay cruises in San Francisco Bay. And there's a big boat, lots and lots of people on it. And you get out close to Alcatraz, and everybody goes to one side of the boat, right? Now, unless they violated some codes or something, the boat's not going to actually tip over and capsize. But could it list just a little bit, tip just a little bit, right? That's what's happening with this atom here. It's just getting a little out of balance. And so we have this partial negative charge here and a partial positive on the other side. It's not always like that. That happens just 
very briefly, my six kids were on the couch just long enough for me to take a picture, and then they started getting up again, right? So the electrons happen to be on one side, and then they move around again. Very short thing. This is an instantaneous dipole or a temporary dipole, and it's just caused by random fluctuations. So that can happen in atoms, it can happen in molecules. Does that make sense? It can just get a little lopsided spontaneously. <coughs> well, that atom being lopsided and having an instantaneous dipole can affect a neighboring atom. So this atom was a little unbalanced and had an instantaneous dipole, little negative over here, little positive over here. The positive here attracts the electrons in the neighboring atom. Like, oh, oh, look, positive charge. And they go over there. That induces an instantaneous dipole in this atom. So now we've got negative charge here, positive charge there. There is a force of attraction between those two atoms that wasn't there before. And this, this dipole here induces a dipole in the neighboring atom. And then those are attracted to each other. And this happens for a fraction of a second, just very briefly. So we've got this guy who's just spontaneously had a dipole, which induced a dipole in this, induced a dipole in that. And before we can even finish talking about it, it's gone, done and gone. But it happens, and it, it comes and goes over and over and over and over again. This is a very, very weak attraction but it happens a lot, and so it does become significant. Does that make sense how one thing can induce a dipole in another? And then there's this little bit of attraction, and then it goes away. <coughs> so dispersion forces occur when neighboring atoms attract one another. You have an instantaneous dipole in one, and that attracts the next one induces a dipole. That's why I like to call them induced dipole forces, because you get one that gets imbalanced, and it induces a dipole. It causes a dipole in the next one, and because of that, they both have a little attraction. So these dipole forces, I'm sorry, the dipoles responsible for these forces are transient. They're constantly appearing and disappearing, because those electron clouds are fluctuating. We learned that electrons are are unpredictable, sketchy characters, right? They just, you know, they're not orbiting like the, the Earth is orbiting the sun and we can predict where it's going to be. They're not like that. They're just in that cloud somewhere. Okay, so those are dispersion forces. The magnitude of the dispersion force, how strong it is, depends on how easily the electrons can polarize in response to an instantaneous dipole. And that depends on the size of the electron cloud. If we have a big electron cloud, it is more easily polarized. Um, you think of something, I don't know. I, I think my analogy maker is um, like permanently damaged, which is really scary. But it's just not working very well anymore. It's very sad. It was so fun. Um, uh, we'll, go with, we'll go with the big family thing, because I have a big family, and so nobody can accuse me of being mean. So larger electron cloud is more easily polarized. So you think of me. I've got six kids. I take them, let's say, to Disneyland, which, you know, it's been a long time, but take them to Disneyland. Am I going to know exactly where all six of them are at all times? No. There's no way. It's a large electron cloud. Okay, and it easily gets lopsided. So think of a small family. Here's mom with one kid going to Disneyland. Does she know where that kid is? Yes. Tight, small electron cloud. Not very likely to get imbalanced. Still can happen, but it's just, it's tight, it's close. Everybody's close to mom, the electrons are close to the nucleus, and they're not going to get all imbalanced like a larger one is. So we find that as the molar mass of a substance or an atom increases, the electron cloud gets bigger, it's more easily polarized, 
and the dispersion forces are greater. <coughs> so molar mass alone does not determine the magnitude, but we can use it as a guide when we're comparing similar elements or compounds. So that's not the end-all, be-all. Well, it's got a larger molar mass. It must have stronger dispersion forces. <coughs> but when we're comparing similar things, it works pretty well. So here are noble gases. <coughs> so helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. Here are their molar masses, ranging from 4 up to 131. So obviously, xenon is a larger atom than helium, right? And here we see their boiling points. The boiling point of a substance is indicative of the strength of its intermolecular attractions. Because what needs to happen for something to boil? The, the particles have to move fast enough to be able to break through. Remember we talked about the Red Rover line? The Red Rover line of molecules trying to escape into the gas state. You've got the molecules at the surface and they're holding hands. If they're stronger in their grip, it's going to take more speed to get out. <coughs> Molecules move faster at high temperatures. So here, xenon boils at 165 Kelvin. Helium boils at 4.2 Kelvin. The helium molecules are held together so weakly that it takes almost no kinetic energy for them to break free. Whereas xenon, you're going to have to heat them up significantly more to get them to break free. Does that make sense? So this table just shows us that as the molar mass increases in comparable substances, okay, these are all in the same group on the periodic table, so they're very similar. As the molecular mass or the molar mass increases, the boiling point increases because the strength of the dispersion forces increases. Xenon with its big, jello-y electron cloud can get lopsided more easily. When it has an instantaneous dipole, it can induce an instantaneous dipole more easily in the next atom, and then the strength of that interaction is going to be a little bit greater. So it's going to happen more often, and it's going to be a little stronger. Does that make sense? So let's look at these two guys. <coughs> Which hydrocarbon has the higher boiling point? So we've got two substances here. Um, and just for grins, let's look at their Lewis structures. So you're like, why would that be a happy situation? I like drawing Lewis structures. So there's methane. And here's C2H6, which is ethane. Do either of those molecules look like they're polar, like they're lopsided? No. And they aren't. These are both nonpolar. Hydrocarbons are always nonpolar. So, and we've only talked about the one kind of force. These have dispersion forces, and which one, so to predict the higher boiling point, we need to identify which one has the stronger intermolecular forces the stronger dispersion forces. It's the bigger one, right? This one is larger. So its electron cloud is more easily moved around, and so the dispersion forces in the C2H6 are going to be greater. So C2H6 has the higher boiling point. And those are, that, you know, that would be a very reasonable exam type question. You know, here's these two or three or however many compounds, you know, identify which one has the highest boiling point or the lowest boiling point or put them in order. So any questions about the dispersion forces? Another type of force is called the dipole-dipole force. And this is, as its name implies, a force of attraction between two dipoles. So this is a force that exists in all polar molecules. Polar molecules have permanent dipoles. 
they're lopsided. And so one end is always slightly positive, the other end is always slightly negative. And so the dipole-dipole force is the attraction between the positive end of a permanent dipole and the negative end of another. So all molecules have dispersion forces, even polar molecules. But the polar molecules also have dipole-dipole forces. So they've got dispersion forces and this additional force. And so then it makes sense that polar molecules are going to have higher melting and boil boiling points relative to nonpolar molecules of similar mass. Because the mass is similar, so the dispersion force strength would be equivalent, but the polar molecules have this added force of attraction between them. So here's an illustration. Um, this is formaldehyde, so here is its Lewis structure, and here is a space-filling model of it. And if we look at this, do you remember the, the rules of thumb, the two little rules I gave you to predict polarity? We look at, for lone pairs on the central atom, and we look to see if all the atoms bonded to the central atom are the same. So to be nonpolar, you have to have no lone pairs. Are there any lone pairs on that carbon? No. So we're okay on that one. Are all of these atoms the same? No, the oxygen's different. So this is a polar molecule. And when we look at the space filling model of it, here we have oxygen, which is very electronegative, and here we have hydrogen, which is not. And so when we add these, all these polar bonds together, we end up with the oxygen end having a partial negative charge and the hydrogen end having a partial positive charge. It's a polar molecule. It has a permanent dipole. The charge distribution is always off-center, out of balance. So then when we have two of these formaldehyde molecules, the positive end of this one is attracted to the negative end of that one. And unlike the dispersion forces, where that was coming and going, this is always there. So that attraction is always there. And these dipole-dipole forces are stronger than the dispersion forces. So let's look at two different compounds and see how the polarity affects them. Now we looked at ethane in a previous example and we determined that ethane was nonpolar. It was all very nice and symmetrical. And we just looked at formaldehyde and we saw that the formaldehyde molecule is polar. The oxygen end is negative and the hydrogen end is positive. If we compare their molar masses, we see that they're essentially the same. Can't get much closer than that. These are the structures. We look at those and we see, yeah, that one's real symmetrical, this one not so much. And we look at their boiling points. Formaldehyde boils at minus 19 degrees. Ethane boils at minus 88 degrees. So just looking at molar masses, we would expect their boiling points to be the same, right? The strength of their dispersion forces is the same. So why is this one so much higher? It all, it's polar and it also has, what's the new force we're talking about? Dipole-dipole forces. Because this molecule is polar, <coughs> It has the dispersion forces plus the dipole-dipole the dipole force. And we see that same trend in the melting point. This melts at minus 172, a much lower temperature than minus 92. And the difference in these melting and boiling points demonstrates, or kind of proves, it demonstrates that the intermolecular forces for this compound are greater than those for that compound. Polarity of, of the molecules also affects miscibility. So there's a, there's a new word. Um, miscible. You can kind of think of that as meaning mixable. Sort of sounds the same. Miscible is mixable. Miscibility is the ability of a liquid to mix with another liquid without separating into two phases. So in general, we find 
that polar liquids are miscible with other polar liquids, but are immiscible with nonpolar liquids. And we've seen that with oil and water. Oil and water are both liquids, but they don't mix. Water is polar, oil is nonpolar. They don't mix together. So here we have a couple of pictures. This is um, an illustration of pentane and water. Now pentane has, let's see, come on. Pentane is C5H12. Five carbons in a row surrounded with hydrogens, a nonpolar molecule. Water is very polar. These guys are not going to mix. Here I have that exact cruet at home. Um, here we see oil and vinegar salad dressing, right? You can shake it up, but as soon as you set it down, it starts to separate. There's a picture of an oil spill. Petroleum from an oil rig and seawater don't mix because the oil is nonpolar and the water is polar and they just will not mix. Any questions? <coughs> so, all, dip all polar molecules have dipole-dipole forces. We said all molecules have dispersion forces. All polar molecules have dipole-dipole forces. And so, <laughs> We, we did talk about this before, but here it is again. So here's, here's the book's method. Determine whether the molecule contains polar bonds, and then determine whether the polar bonds add together to form a net dipole moment. That method doesn't go over real well with students. So this is my method. It works most of the time. Nonpolar if both conditions are true. No lone pairs on the central atom. The atoms bonded to the central atom are the same, or they have the same electronegativity. So let's look at these and determine whether they have dipole-dipole forces. So this first one, I wrote the name out because when it's written this way, it looks a little confusing. It looks like Cl4, that's Ci4, carbon tetraiodide. So we're going to keep it simple with these guys, but this is carbon with four iodine molecules around it. Now, those iodine molecules are going to have lone pairs. We don't care. For this, this sort of a question, we don't care. The central atom, with those four bonds, <coughs> does it have its octet satisfied? Yes. It does. So that tells us, even without doing the whole making the Lewis structure thing, there's no lone pairs because everything we do in this class is going to follow the octet rule. So four bonds, no lone pairs. So is this a polar molecule? No. No lone pairs. All these atoms bonded to the central atom are the same. So this is nonpolar. The question is, does it have dipole-dipole forces? No. Nonpolar molecules do not have dipole-dipole forces. Only polar molecules. <laughs> How about this next one? CH3Cl. Is that one polar? Yes. Yeah. Again, we have no lone pairs, but now we've got an odd guy. Instead of all of these being the same, we have one that's different. This one's polar. Does it have dipole dipole forces? Yes. How about HCl? That's a diatomic molecule, just two atoms. Most of the time, if it's two different atoms, it's going to be polar. So we've got hydrogen and chlorine, and so that one's polar, and that one has dipole-dipole forces. Any questions?
The third type of uh, intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. Um, this occurs in polar molecules that have hydrogen atoms that are directly bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. And this is uh, another, another type of intermolecular force. It's called a hydrogen bond, even though it's not actually a bond. I think the best way to think of it is it is a super dipole-dipole force. It's just an extra strong dipole-dipole force. And so we need to be able to recognize which of these polar molecules will have this. Um, <coughs> Do you see the movie E.T.? What did E.T. say? E.T. phone home! And he pointed at the sky, right? Is a ET phone home. Well, it's such an awesome movie. It's an awesome movie. So we can use ET to help us to remember what polar molecules have hydrogen bonding. If you've got F, O, or N bonded to hydrogen, phone home. Okay? He didn't know how to spell. Then a polar molecule with one of those bonds, you have hydrogen bonding. And the reason that hydrogen bonds are extra strong is because you have a, a large electronegativity difference between hydrogen and these, F, O, and N. Those are the three most electronegative elements. Remember, fluorine's the most, oxygen and nitrogen are right next to it. So these guys are very electronegative and these molecules, I'm sorry, these atoms are small. Okay, they're in the second period, they're small, and so it allows neighboring molecules to get in close. These forces of attraction between molecules are based on opposite charges, and the strength of that interaction falls off very strongly as the distance increases. It's a little bit like with magnets, right? When magnets are very close, the, st the strength of the field is very, for very, very strong. Yeah, the force is strong. The force is not strong with me. Um, but when you move them apart, the force gets much weaker, right? And you could take a magnet on a refrigerator and it'll stick up there just fine and it'll hold up one piece of paper. Put ten pieces of paper up there? Probably not, unless it's a really strong magnet, right? The, what's the difference in that distance between one piece of paper and ten pieces of paper? It's not very much, and yet it has a large effect on the strength of the attraction. And that's how these electrostatic attractions are as well. And so because these, molecule, these atoms, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, are small with the hydrogen, it allows them to get closer together in their molecules, and so the, the hydrogen bonding is, is stronger. So let's look at hydrogen fluoride. So here we have an HF molecule. So this is a polar molecule, right? It's just got two atoms and they're not the same. So we're going to say, yeah, that's a polar molecule. So it has dipole-dipole forces. It has induced dipole forces as well because everything does. The dispersion forces, sorry. Dispersion forces. So it's got dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding. So because we have this hydrogen fluoride bond, which is in the phone home, then we've got an extra strong dipole here. So this partial positive is a little larger than a regular one. And this partial negative is a little bit bigger. And so we have more attraction between these. And this electrostatic attraction between the fluorine on one and the hydrogen on the other is the hydrogen bond. This is not the hydrogen bond. That is a covalent bond between hydrogen and fluorine. It's this attraction between the charged ends of these molecules that's the hydrogen bond. It is not a covalent bond. Not. It's just electrostatic attraction. It's just a super dipole-dipole force. Okay? Methanol also has hydrogen bonding. 
So here's the space filling model of methanol. Here we have carbon bonded to two hydrogens, and that does, doesn't, well, there's another one hiding back there. That doesn't really do anything. But here we have oxygen bonded to hydrogen. This is a polar molecule. It's a polar molecule. We can see that this end is different than that end. And so this oxygen is going to be a little bit negative. The hydrogen on it is going to be a little bit positive. So it's polar. It's got dipole-dipole forces. But we also have this oxygen-hydrogen bond. And so then we're going to get the interaction between the hydrogen on one molecule and the oxygen on another molecule to give us this extra strong intermolecular force. So the hydrogen atom on each methanol molecule is attracted to the oxygen of its neighbor. The hydrogen bond is between hydrogen on one molecule and fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen on another molecule. But in order for those interactions to occur, you also have to have a covalent bond between hydrogen and one of those atoms in this molecule. So when we look at the, um, when we look at the formula for methanol, CH3OH, So here's the OH. That's the oxygen-hydrogen bond that we need to see. Polar molecule with an OH bond. We're going to have hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen bonding occurs, though, between the hydrogen on one molecule and the oxygen on another molecule. We can see the effect of this um, comparing methanol and ethane. We've looked at ethane before. Here's the structure of ethane. It's nonpolar, right? And here's methanol that we were just looking at. This is a polar molecule and we see it's got the OH bond. So we can have hydrogen bonding here. The molar masses of these two are very similar, 32 versus 30.1. So strength of dispersion forces doesn't going to matter. But look at the difference now between the boiling points. Methanol boils at 64.7 degrees Celsius, and ethane boils at minus 88. This is a much larger difference than we saw just with the presence of dipole-dipole forces. When we compared the formaldehyde, I think it was, with uh, whatever one we compared it with, ethane. In fact, let's go back there real quick. There we go. Yeah, formaldehyde and ethane. This is a polar molecule, but can it have hydrogen bonding? ET phone home. There's hydrogen carbon bonds, but that's not going to do it. There's an oxygen present, but there's no hydrogen bonded to it. So there's no hydrogen bonding here. Here the boiling point was minus 19. Similar molar mass. So at all times we have to do the Lewis structure to figure it out. You can't do you have to do the Lewis structure every time? Um, you don't have to do the full-out Lewis structure. Um, you, you do need to look at something like this just to see how the, how the different atoms are connected. And we're going to stick to really small molecules. Okay, we're not going get, to get into the big crazy things. But here the boiling point is 64. And so the effect of this oxygen-hydrogen bond enabling the hydrogen bonding to occur between the molecules, the effect of that is huge. And we see the difference in the, in the melting points as well. Minus 172 versus minus 97. So here's another, another illustration of hydrogen bonding. This is what happens in water. So water is a, is a small molecule. It's a hydrogen atom and, I'm sorry, an oxygen atom, and two hydrogen atoms. But we've got OH bonds. Polar molecule with OH bonds, hydrogen bonding. And so here with the red dots, we're indicating the hydrogen bonding that occurs between molecules. And you see that one, one molecule can hydrogen bond to more than one other molecule. And here's the illustration with the space filling models. <coughs> we don't think of water as being all that remarkable, we just kind of take it for granted because it's everywhere, right? 
And yet water is a very unusual compound. And many of the unusual characteristics that it has are because of the hydrogen bonding. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. And this is remarkably high for a molecule with a molar mass of 18. That's a very small molecule to have such a high boiling point. Um, I guess we don't have, we don't have this. I'm going to draw you this table. I need to put it in here because it's just pretty impressive. So up here in the corner, I'm going to draw a little graph for you. So if we graph, so this is 100, and down here is about minus 100. So here, what we're looking at is H2X. Um, let's put a little more information in here. That's uh, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is the, the uh, period that the X element is in. So in period 2, we've got oxygen. The boiling point of oxygen, I'm sorry, of H2O, H2X with oxygen being the X, is 100 degrees Celsius. If we look at the other members of that group, H2S, H2SE, and H2TE, they form this trend. And this makes sense. Those are polar molecules. But as, as we go from H2S to H2SE to H2TE, the molar mass is getting larger, right? And we said a larger molar mass, a larger molecule is going to have stronger dispersion forces. And so that's the explanation for this trend. But what would we expect for the boiling point of water? If, that, if we followed that trend, we'd expect it to be down here. So just following that trend, we would expect the boiling point of water to be about minus 100 degrees Celsius. That would change life as we know it, wouldn't it? If all water was a gas at room temperature, that would, there would be no life, right? Because water is essential for life. Why is the boiling point of water so high? because of hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen bonding in water is very, very strong, and that has a huge effect on its boiling point. Hydrogen bonding is important for all kinds of things. This is an illustration of uh, DNA. DNA forms a double helix. It's got two strands of DNA that are attached to each other, and they coil up in this double helix. And the reason it forms two strands that are coiled up like that is because of the hydrogen bonds that occur between the bases on these strands of, of DNA. And so we get two hydrogen bonds forming between <coughs> thymine and adenine and three forming between cysteine and guanine. And so if we didn't have hydrogen bonding, your DNA wouldn't work. Um, and hydrogen bonding just shows up in all kinds of things. It's a really important concept. So here's a table summarizing types of intermolecular forces. We've got the dispersion forces, or London forces. Relative strength, these are weak. Okay, these are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. But as the molar mass increases, as the size of the molecule or the atom increases, it gets stronger. And so we can use that to compare. These are present in everything. Everything has dispersion forces. And here we have an example of dispersion forces between hydrogen molecules. The dipole-dipole forces are moderate in strength. They're stronger than dispersion forces. These occur only in polar molecules, but in all polar molecules. And here we have a, an illustration. Hydrogen bonds are the strongest, the strongest intermolecular force. And these happen when you have a polar molecule containing hydrogen bonded directly to F-O or, excuse me, F-O or N. That's E-T phone home. Now, we say that these are strong, and yet it's important to keep in mind that covalent bonds are much stronger. 
So even though hydrogen bonds are strong, they're about one-tenth the strength of a covalent bond. So compared to the bonds that are actually holding the molecule itself together, these intermolecular forces are weak. But the hydrogen bond is the, most, is the strongest. So this table pretty much summarizes what you need to know about these intermolecular forces. You should know the order that hydrogen bonds are the strongest. You should know that polar molecules have dipole-dipole forces, that all molecules and atoms have dispersion forces. So which has the higher boiling point, F, HF or HCl? HF. HF. Very good. Why? It's got a higher, a stronger intermolecular force. So what kind of intermolecular force is that? It has hydrogen bonds. Okay, that's the strongest. Cl hydrogen chloride doesn't have hydrogen bonds because the hydrogen is bonded to chlorine. There's no HF, HO, or HN bond. Hydrogen chloride is a polar molecule, has dipole-dipole forces, as dispersion forces, but HF has those as well. It has the hydrogen bonds in addition, and that's why it has the higher boiling point. Remember, stronger intermolecular forces, higher melting point, higher boiling point.